So uh, thank you very much to everyone for uh, an incredibly productive meeting and thought-provoking meeting. I'm, I'm totally aware of the fact that all of our brains are relatively fried by this time of the day. Certainly mine, mine uh, is, so I, I, I don't think I can talk for that long. Uh, what I wanted to do, though, was just go through uh, some of the, the, just the critical points that have come up again and again in the course of the meeting. I'm not going to rehash the points that emerge from each of the separate working group summaries. I think um, the documents that were circulated beforehand give a pretty good guide and we'll, uh, we'll be providing uh, in, the, in the very near future uh, sort of what we saw as, as the key points emerging from each of those discussions. But in terms of the general points that, that I saw as, as coming up again and again in, in the discussion today, the first really was this, this idea that we need to start adopting an explicitly statistical approach um, across an analysis in, in, a, in a wide range of different diseases. And I think Mark, uh, Mark made that case very well. And, and also the point that this, this is certainly possible even in the case of rare disease. So it's not the case that if we have very small sample sizes, we can't at least make some attempt to define a rigorous statistical framework for analysing the, uh, like the probability of causality of, of variants that are seen in those cases. So here, so here the idea of considering patient sequence in the context of very large sets of reference sequence data I think does give us a, a, an, a, the possibility of, of, of approaching this rigorously. The, the second point that came up in multiple groups presentations was the idea that uh, experimental or computational support for a variance impact on biological function is, is not in any way a replacement for compelling statistical evidence. So it should be weighted in some way as, as being, as contributing to the level of evidence perhaps, but it's not sufficient to, uh, to push weak statistical evidence over the line. And maybe there is still some controversy about that point, but I, I, mean, I, I felt that was, seemed to be the general consensus of, of the group. Uh, a, a key issue that I, I think it's important to highlight, if only because it's not widely appreciated by, uh, by many groups who are entering the next generation sequencing space is the degree to which sequencing technology is still immature. And we heard uh, some examples of problems that arise from NGS um, and Gonzalo and I can both certainly testify to the challenges uh, that we've had with, with small insertions and deletions, predicted highly functional variants and the, uh, the issues with, with validating those. So the, the key points here are really that there is a, a strong need for stringent quality control at the outset of a study. Um, for, for applying variant filters that are appropriate, obviously balancing uh, false positive and false negative rates, and also this, this key need for independent validation, which I think is very, very familiar in the clinical context, uh, but not, not always uh, thought about in a, in a sensible way in a, in a, research, a research setting. We, we also heard a number of times about the dangers associated with cryptic multiple testing um, as we enter the world of uh, rare variant analysis in an, aggregated, in an aggregate setting where it's not clear the unit of aggregation, frequency cutoffs, uh, exactly which functional criteria should, would, uh, should be used, and also in the context of functional testing where there are many different possible combinations of experiments and parameters that could be used to define functional support for a variant. Uh, it would be relatively easier for, for researchers to simply try every possible combination and come up with something that fits and generate some high impact result as, uh, as a result of that. I don't necessarily know that the group came up with a clear consensus on how that approach should be addressed, whether it, whether it came down to defining a relatively small number of sensible statistical approaches that could be tried, whether it's, as, as Gonzalo suggested, just setting very, very conservative statistical thresholds that allow for the fact that researchers will try everything and see what works. Um, and perhaps that's something that we could discuss before, before we finish today, if, the, if there is any time at all. But that, that seems like, at least in the, in the follow-up discussion, might be a critical point to consider. Um, in terms of outcomes from the meeting, or things that we really need to think about as we put the, the paper together, the first is uh, there, was, there was acknowledgement of a clear and urgent need for improved databases in at least two areas, or at least two broad types of databases. The first is, is very familiar to everyone here, and that is uh, the need for a single comprehensive and, and actually, you know, really thoroughly annotated database of human disease mutations. And that was, the, the model for that was articulated extremely well by the known variants group, uh, how, that, how that might be conceptualised and put together. Uh, David Goldstein also uh, highlighted this idea of, of extending that potentially to some kind of wiki-like database of functional and phenotypic information associated with every base in the human genome. Uh, so then allowing for the fact that the clinical variants are just some subset of that, of that overall database. That's obviously a much more ambitious scheme, uh, but you can see this being a, 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 staged, a staged approach. The second class of database that was discussed was the idea of a, a repository of aggregated sequence data, and as well, critically, as controlled and detailed phenotype data from both healthy controls and also from rare disease families. And this, this obviously would be ideal in this case if, we, uh, if there was the ability at least for some fraction of the samples in that database 
to be able to recontact them for more detailed phenotyping. Uh, that won't always be possible, but that, that would be ideal. And I think there was consensus that, that this shouldn't really necessarily be two separate databases. I mean, I think that will need to be discussed, but there would certainly be huge advantages to having a, a controlled, control over the quality and the, the format of the data uh, in, that includes, that spans both the control set and the, the patient data set. Uh, obviously, th there's a, a need for this group as a whole to determine the extent to which these, uh, the needs for these, met by these databases may or may not already be met by ongoing efforts such as ClinVar uh, or the NHGRI data aggregation project. And I think there will certainly be some, uh, some of these needs will be met, but perhaps not all. Uh, so there will just be a, a need to identify exactly what, what the space of needs that aren't being met is. And finally, uh, an idea that was raised, perhaps not discussed at, at huge le uh, length, but I, I think was, was pretty compelling, was the idea that uh, we do need to come up or at least assess the, the possibility of producing a consensus pipeline for looking at the probability of pathogenicity for novel variants uh, or, or, or for novel genes observed in a, in a patient. We obviously need a system that works across all classes of variation, um, and it, it's important that this be that the system, the validity of the system, be assessed in a strongly standardised and prospective study. Ideally, uh, in in the same way as as medi other medical prediction tools are assessed. Um, he Heidi presented, I think, in her presentation, a, a model as to how this could potentially work, um, but she also noted that there is a relatively little consensus between clinical labs as to how these these issues are approached. So getting a, a group of people together who understand each of the pieces that would be needed to pull such a pipeline together would be phenomenally useful. So those are, those are the, the areas that I saw as, as sort of the, the key overall uh, areas. There'll be individual recommendations and guidelines that emerge from each of the individual working groups, but I won't, as I said, go through those at the moment. Um, so I th uh, I'm not sure exactly. No, why, don't, why don't we discuss mm -hmm. these then? So, so are there yeah, that's right. yeah. comments or, or issues? Mm -hmm. Just do people agree with you? you want to go back to the top? And Mm -hmm. The only thing that's bugging me, and this is really a question, is whether the asymmetry of the compelling statistical evidence versus experimental, because I can imagine compelling experimental uh, data that uh, should be regarded as a replacement for the lack of compelling statistics. And it's stuff like penetrance, right? Where you have a variable penetrance, and so you have, in, a, in the penetrant case, you have a really great uh, story, and then the statistics don't bear it out because actually, you know, it, it, it depends on other things, but I, and I can't decide, I really can't decide if that this asymmetry that statistics should trump mm -hmm. experimental, I mean, even saying it uh, is, yeah. is, is, seems like anathema. <laughs> I, I, I agree, I mean, that, that's my bias, and so I, I, I think it's, uh, there, I felt that there were probably more people leaning in that direction than otherwise, but I'd obviously like to discuss it with the group. So, Magdalena. So I wanted to comment on this because it, it sort of returns to, to the question that I posed in a much more open way uh, earlier on today. And I'm also kind of intrigued by this, and, and it bugs me in, in perhaps for, for, for different reasons. Of course, I um, sort of, on the other side of the table, represent this community within a general journal. But there will be other editors who handle other papers in which the predominant part of the story comes from the functional world, from the people who don't have the insight into the statistics that everybody or most people at this table have. And in the extreme case scenario, um, if the paper or the story is, is deemed strong from a functional perspective, the weak statistical, statistical evidence gets removed completely. Right, so what, what I think, so I keep thinking about it from the perspective that, you know, this is an informed group of people, but the message has to go out to a much wider community. So that's on my perspective on the same problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that there certainly, <clears throat> I don't think we mean to imply that, you know, functional work is not publishable even in the highest impact journals. I think just people often put the genetics, the human genetics in as a way of saying, here, this really proves that this is the gene that's responsible for this phenotype in humans. And I think that's what can't be, if that part of it is weak, then that's what I think people are arguing that the, the functional data can't be used to buttress that part of it. So, so yeah, no, I think it's critical to, I mean, here we're talking about in the context of a study that is saying, we believe that this variant is causal in this disease. And so 
I, I guess there will be some cases where you can come up with really compelling functional support, but in, in most cases, you know, really, you need that statistical data to show that initial association between. What brain. happens if there's genomic backgrounds that allow high penetrance in some cases and no penetrance in other cases, even in the case where the allele is 50-50 in cases and controls, but all the cases have unmeasured environmental or genomic background, and it really is causative in those guys, with an asterisk that there's a lot of other things that also have to be checked. And that's why I'm not sure, because maybe that asterisk means that you can fall back on the statistics if you have enough of the conditional variables all measured. So, so it all depends about claims. I mean, if, if you appropriately caveat that, then perhaps right. that is perfectly sensible. So if it's 50-50 in the cases and the controls, but all the other, you know, there's a bunch of other dependent variables that determine who has the outcome, then those are the, those other things are the things that need to be measured and associated. I mean, the 50-50 thing isn't causing anything. But I think I just come back to, I resonate with the point that, that Joel made, is that there's a distinct difference between two types of papers. One is we started with a patient with a severe phenotype or we started with a disease that we're focused on. We screened the genome and we're trying to prove that this is the gene for that disease. That's one type of paper. That needs to rely on statistics. There's no question about it. There is another type of paper that, you know, groups that have a keen interest in a certain part, piece of functional biology or a certain gene from a functional standpoint sometimes are wrapping in some human data in an effort to make, you know, their functional, you know, story or their gene seem more exciting. I think this is where a lot of people get into trouble and where it's a little harder to say, you know, there could be a lot of stories um, and a lot of functional data and models that are actually very much worth publishing because they enlighten us on the biology of certain genes and so forth. And the human genetics may not be the leading part of that, but we can't also allow it to sort of just be used as a throwaway just to sort of elevate the profile. And I think that's where the, the difficulty comes in. And I apologize, I do have to leave. I, I just want to say that 50-50 is interesting if it's a necessary but not sufficient variation. But Right? So if it's necessary for... It needs to be an excess, though. I mean, I, I just don't understand the model that... The other the static the other model where you have to have this but allele... It, but it should become more common. But yeah, yeah. For it, it would have it to be has more to be common, mentioned. except in the, in, the, in the... I mean, there is this strange model in epistasis theory that allows things to be 50-50 if there are other factors which promote in the presence of that allele and protect in the presence of the same allele in other right, circumstances. Right. But, but there are certainly alleles in inbred strains of mice which have a phenotype. So, but you know, one thing that I, I did like is uh, David Goldstein's suggestion. You know, f having some set of some statement or some language that you where you say, you know, how compelling is the statistical evidence? You know, and you don't have to say in every paper that the statistical evidence definitely implicates this variant or this gene. You could say this statistical evidence makes this gene interesting or it, you know, says this gene is worthy of further consideration. You, you could have different levels and then you can, you can then build on that and do other things. But, it, but it, it is nice to be able to separate, you know, and, and, that, and that actually lets people do whatever they want. You could still publish a paper that, where the statistical evidence it's completely not compelling. You you just have you just have some phrasing to describe what it is. You know, and I, I'm sure within the creative set of people we have here, we could have a phrase where, you know, saying it's not compelling at all actually sounds not too bad, and someone wouldn't feel too offended to write in their own paper. Right, so we can devise our secret code for for labeling variants. That sounds that sounds reasonable. Mark first. I would just urge, and since everyone is here, as, as it not be a secret code. I mean, if, if people want to actually create a bar for the word causal or create a bar for a particular word that they actually define it, because I mean, having an, a, an actual practical definition is really useful or something. I mean, I think, you know, that's, that's actually where the problems all lie. I mean, where one person thinks suggestive means this, another person thinks associated means this. I think if, if, you, if things can be defined, then a lot of the problems disappear. Oh, yes. Just a, as a, a second to that, I, one very useful thing that might come out of this paper might be some sort of like mini glossary of this is, you know, mm -hmm. causal comes with certain consequences in terms of burden of proof and it needs to be clear where that proof is coming from in your mind and, and damaging means this and deleterious means, you know, so you could imagine just trying to lay out, obviously it can't be a comprehensive 
sort of listing, but some sort of concise but useful list of, of what we ex what we should expect a certain term to imply. And the causal should there's causal for a gene, and then there's causal for a variant. Yeah. Those are. Those two lines of evidence as being separate. Okay. Other comments on this, though? You want to just go, go back up so that yeah, we can sure. see, see what you have there? Sorry about this terrible format. Yeah. Yeah, maybe this is the consensus, but I do, I, I, or the emerging consensus, I do think we should back off that statement a little bit. I think bit. so too. Yeah, the second, mm -hmm. the second sub bullet there. Mm -hmm. yeah. Should not be regarded. What's that? Place. Yeah, just, just, I mean. How, how, would, like how, how should yeah, it be worded? Um, What's the, well, it's, it still needs compelling statistical evidence, but the, you know. The, 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 maybe the statistical evidence and the experimental evidence should be well separated and yes, separately and, and judged or something like that. clearly identified and that, but. Um, um, I mean, including negative experimental results or whatever, yeah. So somebody has to turn their mic. I mean, what we're saying is they're all, they're, what we heard all day is that there are different kinds of evidence to support significance and that we would like to see papers address each uh, category of information. And any given category may not be absolutely required, but it should be said, you know, we have strong functional evidence, we have strong genetic evidence. We don't have great statistical evidence, but we don't have the sample or something like that. I think we could say statistical evidence is the best evidence, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But there may be situations where it's. So I think that was what it's, was objecting to, was, was Well, I mean, uh, I mean, there are scenarios where you, you can't get the statistical evidence, right? Or, you know, so the Vamsi Mutha paper we were supposed to read, you know, I think those findings were pretty clear, right? It was, it was but those, those, the implication of those two genes were based on one patient, right? Po accompanied by some pretty powerful experimental results, right? Um, so. But it's kind of hard to, to try and put these two things as, uh, you know, things that can oppose each other. You, you know, the, the biological evidence could be right. It could be that if you knock out this gene, you get the disease. But that doesn't have any, you know, that doesn't say anything about what happens if you have a non-synonymous variant or a particular non-specific, even premature stop, because the premature stop might not knock out the function that's key, you know. So, and likewise, even more clear, you know, you could have very clear genetic evidence. You could have a series of, of functional assays that show no function. So, uh, right. So, uh, in terms of statistical functional evidence, and in terms of separating uh, ev statistical evidence at the level of gene or locus versus evidence for individual variant, and um, at least currently the situation is that statistical evidence is obtainable for uh, for a gene or locus. In GWAS, we have association. If we're talking rare variants, we have burden of our dispersion tests, collapsing variants together. This can bring uh, sufficient statistical evidence. However, if we're talking about individual causal variants, it's it's completely different problem. Uh, in rare variants, if if the variant is singleton, there is no way to provide any statistical evidence. In in GWAS, LD complicates fine mapping and and identification of causal variants. So, uh, if we if we'd like to discriminate between causality of variants and causality of genes, then the the value of statistical evidence is very different relative to experimental evidence. I was just going to say, I, I kind of feel like if you're going to claim that variant X causes phenotype Y, there has to be a bar that we have to live with that's going to produce some false negatives, right? So, but at the same time, I believe we should probably be able to conclude that a singleton is causative on the basis of it's not inconsistent with some genetic model, and it also is supported by this overwhelming other evidence. But I, I mean, I, I think we have to agree that causality is a tough bar, and we're not going to get there for a lot of cases, but genetics should be the sort of first best line for calling something causal, right? Uh, it, the highlighted uh, statement, um, to me, I think that needs to be broken apart, at least unless it's somewhere else in the document. In other words, we said experimental uh, evidence, that, that we want to say that experimental evidence that indicates that a particular variant has a functional consequence is useful. Uh, 
uh, that does not necessarily prove that that functional variation causes the phenotype. That's the problem. Yeah. And so to, in order to make that leap, then we can use functional evidence or genetic evidence, I mean, um, statistical evidence or genetic evidence or evidence from model systems or whatever. I think one way to capture that is to, is to try and um, describe precisely the proximity of the assay to the phenotype, right? If you have a patient who has the metabolite upstream of the enzyme is high and the, and the metabolite downstream of the enzyme is low, and your variant causes that same exact biochemical effect in vitro, you're very proximate to the defect you're observing in the patient, whereas some of these other things like mutating a transcription factor that only works in a three-day window during the first trimester of development, that's a harder one to connect the dots on. And so I think that, that proximity thing. And then the second thing is I think there's, we talked about statistics in two ways here, I thought, which was I thought folks were talking about having some sort of a statistical um, way of thinking about functional assays also right, and the specificity of the assay and how likely it is that the assay generates that output as a nonspecific effect of a variation versus a specific effect of that variation. And so there's statistics in, in there, and then there's functional versus the statistical genetics data. So those are two different kinds. Of Absolutely agree. So I should have, I mean, in the interest of time, I've, I've, I haven't gone through the points from the individual okay. uh, groups, but here I... I think it is a, an absolutely critical point made by the, that functional data discussion was that specificity argument and also the, uh, the, the fact that there needs to be a strong emph emphasis on multiple independent lines of evidence uh, leading to functionality. Okay. Yeah. So we have, we have Suzanne, Ewan, and Shamil. Okay. And I think with the statistical evidence, you, you have to be a little bit careful because you could get some very magnificent p-value, but that could also just be because of all kinds of bias you introduced into your analysis. So it maybe is... Even if you have a very significant p-value, that is probably not, is that, that's n definitely not enough on its own. So you would like to see replication and also some other evidence would be nice. So I think rep replication is also quite key. Although, of course, in some cases that's difficult, I realize that. But we have to realize that just a very small p-value by itself doesn't necessarily mean that really is the p-value. And, and I think it's kind of a, <clears throat> a similar point, but I've, I've been in rooms with basic science colleagues having the same discussion where they have this the other way around. They say that an association, no matter how good the p-value, is never a causation. I mean, that's, you know, so it doesn't matter how, how close the association is. And until you have mechanistic data from several different places, you cannot decide causality. So they would have this actually the other way around, you know. Uh, so I wanted to comment on combination of um, functional and statistical evidence because they, they shouldn't necessarily be considered separately. And one, one example may be, similarly to co how we calibrate computational methods, if you have a gene, Mendelian trait, and you have several variants or number of variants with a lot of segregation data, full statistical support, and you know that this particular functional essay gets all of them right, as opposed to variants which do not segregate. Maybe for N plus first variant, you can trust uh, functional essay, even if you do not have enough statistical support. Another uh, consideration is that uh, papers, early papers on burden tests, where multiple variants in the same gene are associated collectively with complex trait. Um, so some papers utilize the following, uh, the following approach, that you do a functional experiment, use 35 variants based on in vitro experiment, for example, into neutral and, and functional, restrict your statistical test to functional, and your p-value drops significantly. So you combine iterative statistical approach, so first you, you use statistics to guide you it, uh, to the original association, and then you show that uh, putting functional data into statistical tests uh, provides much more compelling statistical evidence. So, they, so this idea of combined functional and statistical approach. I was just gonna say, I think we all know what we mean by statistical evidence sitting around this table, but I actually think it's a very hard to understand term, particularly for somebody who doesn't live in a genetics world. So I think we need to actually think about a better 
expression to that, and I don't want to split hairs, but I just, you know, because we have statistical evidence that the functional studies proved something. So I, I think we need to just be a little bit more clear and actually think about what we, what is a better term that will, will make sense to a wider audience about uh, a sequence-based um, statistical genetic approach or something like that. I, I'm, my brain's a little fried, but I think we need a better term for that. I just wanted to amplify. Um, I do think that it, you know, we could, we could sort of take two perspectives in coming, uh, sort of formulating things. One, pers one extreme perspective, we'd say, well, there's a lot of, you know, subtlety and ambiguity and things, and we shouldn't have a very uh, strong um, perspective. Another, pers w another would be that we should take a very strong perspective and be very prescriptive, and you know, we should do this. But I just want to point out, <laughs> having a conversation with Magdalene about this is. Imagine we take the former position and we don't come out with a very strong position on things. What tends to happen is the community just de facto makes these decisions. You know, papers will be published. You know, they, they will set the standard. You know, people will refer to them. So I think that it's actually intelligent now if you can make a, a, a potentially strong statement to do that. Um, I, I may, hey, Daniel, did you, did you have any other questions? No, just to no. say, so I will circulate the, the full list of guidelines like as soon as possible to the whole group so there is a chance to feedback yeah. quickly after the meeting uh, rather than, you know, so there's not time for everything to evaporate. And then I, I did have one, one slide to show on, on sort of, um, um, kind of, we had talked about publication standards or what to do in, in terms of publications and just to give some, some advice to... And I, I think we heard a lot last night and, and again today about, uh, about basically tightening standards or at least making them far more explicit, um, both what's, uh, what, the, what criteria might be within a journal and also what it is that the author is, is proposing. Um, it, I, I think we heard also that um, people should be really mostly describing associations and not causality, that there, there are overblown claims for causality and, and one needs to be very careful. I know I spent the first I won't tell you how many years of my career in epidemiology knocking causality. We, we almost never could, could conclude it. And, and you know, it's, it's almost never that you can. You need a randomized clinical trial. So, so you know, it's, and even then, it's, it's questionable. Um, and then there was, there was an issue of higher and, and clearer thresholds for causality um, at, from the authors themselves. So what is it that they are proposing is the, uh, the threshold that they're using? Why is that? And, and what specifically there were so that they're very explicit about it. Uh, we heard that we wanted to, to have sort of a structured proof for why the variants, uh, why the authors believe that a variant is causal. So, so okay, you're saying that it's causal. You know, you've you've defined your threshold. What's the evidence within your your set of experiments that proves that? Um, and then, then of course, you know, deposit the data on which is based in a queryable database, which we've heard multiple times. But in, in terms of, of the answers, what should be in a paper and what should be judged in a paper? Does does this sort of capture it? I mean, stringent thresholds, very explicit. Um, you know, providing a, a basically a logical proof. Or are, were there other things that, that we need that are not captured here? Les? Uh, I'm not 100% sure I agree with tighten publication okay. standards. I Just think make some journals have very tight mm -hmm. standards right now. And I think we should say that they need to be stringent, but I don't think we should say that all journals need to increase their standards. I, I would argue even there's some journals may have a propensity to conservatism. A few of our very, very best journals um, and hmm? well, no, I don't just think we don't need to be telling people who have very high standards to raise them because they may be perfectly appropriate, but they should be high, and and we would love it if they were uniform. They never will be, of course. A much more consistent. About one being allowed to publish things that are not necessarily slam dunks, right? So I guess. Less consistent than the standard is the consistency of the terminology. Yes. Right. That's and the, the layout or whatever it is. Right. I think that the claim should be consistent with the content, basically. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Terry, there's yes. one thing that is missing up there, which is um, what Mark talked about in his opening talk, which is correcting the publication record. Yeah. So, so that's something that we need to address somewhere. <laughs> 
Um, and and I, I guess I'm not sure how. Well, maybe, maybe we won't worry about how. We'll, we'll just say that we should. Um, there should be some mechanism, and, and the magic happens here. Uh -huh. When there is that, you know, the, the beauty of science. The beauty of science is not its consistency, but its correctability. And 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 so I, I think we count on the peer-reviewed literature right. to do that. So are you saying that we need to encourage people to? pick away at existing things more, or to publish when they've found that something isn't true, to be bold about publishing that, or is that? I think so, yeah. Uh, and, and perhaps that's something that we need to build into the database, right, is if something has been um, shown to be disproved later or not held up, then that might need to be incorporated into the database. Mm -hmm. Yes. I was just gonna make the point that we should probably try and be clear that this is not necessarily the same as what you would recommend for a clinician is that, you know, obviously yes. they have to use the judgment of the risks of not acting on a, mm -hmm. on a real variant have to be weighed against the risks of acting on a false positive and that these standards might clar clarify the terminology, but they don't necessarily give you any sort of clinical guidelines on what you should or should not do in any given circumstance. Right, and, and I think we, we did hear from, from David Dimmick that, that while the clinical labs depend on the, on the research, the, you know, obviously they have to interpret the research, but, but we, we may provide a, a broader brush that they need to choose from. That's right, and I think we can, as, as Heidi mentioned, the ACMG guidelines will, you know, will provide pretty stringent guidance in that front. I almost wonder if we could do with a, an intermediate term. I don't know whether like implicate would, would, would be a good word or something else, and we can, we can probably argue about that again. But it, it might be nice to have a way in which you can say, well, we think this leads to this disease, but we don't meet the standards of causality. So that there's something, there's a punchy single word that you can put in a title that says, we've got some degree of proof, but it's not all the way there. That is, that is a, 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 an accepted word that, that everyone knows means We've done a lot of work, and this is very exciting, but it's not, it's not at a point where it's a slam dunk. Maybe likely candidate or something like that? Strong it's candidate. Not wimp, it's too wimpy. It's not going to, it's not uh, You don't want enough. it to be too strong, though, either. Yeah, the, I mean, the problem with those things is that, you know, someone who reads the paper is not going to necessarily think about the extreme care you chose in the exact words. They're just going to say, aha, this is the gene for blah, blah, blah. So yeah, I think you'd be very careful about that. Well, Jeff, are you arguing for a numerical score that we should, we should apply across the board? So, yeah. Having said that these are, we're talking about uh, research standards, it might also be worth putting in there that although these standards are designed for a research endeavor, they're useful things to think about when interpreting clinical ver uh, in the clinical ar uh, arena. Yeah, and we'll obviously we'll wordsmith this a, a little bit so that when you see it, it looks a little bit better. Other thoughts? Any, any thoughts from the, the fourth estate is, as to whether, <laughs> is this useful to you? Do you need, do you need more from us? Or you always want more from us. Yeah. <laughs> Less. Uh, just change higher and clearer thresholds for causality to high and clear. Because some, some journals actually don't need to raise that bar anymore. I think we're just about finished. Um, so, so just to, to let you know in terms of, of next steps, as Daniel said, what we'll try to do is take at least these summary points and maybe this slide, send it out to you, you know, get it out to you within the next few days or so, um, at, at least so you can take a look at it and make sure we haven't completely missed the boat. And then would hope to have a draft manuscript out to you very, very soon, recognizing that, that we do have a couple of big meetings coming up after, just after this, everybody does, um, as, as well as other things. But we'll do our best to get that done quickly so we don't uh, forget. Just in terms of, of authorship, um, you, you really have to respond in order for us to meet the criteria for the ICMJE, so, so be sure that you do get back to us. We know that all your emails work, at least as of tonight, today, so um, if we don't hear from you, we're, we're going to have to conclude that you, you're not interested in participating and we'll, we'll acknowledge you, but we, we won't be able to list you on the masthead. So please, we want everybody to continue to participate and please, please do respond. Um, anything from the planning committee? Yes, David? So are, are the slides available? 
Um, they, they are and will be, um, not immediately. So they, they will all be posted on the, the NHGRI website. I'm not sure exactly when that will happen. Um, and I know that the, the, uh, the, the videos are available now, so you can watch them go by. Um, but but getting, the, getting the slides themselves, we, we can probably put them on a SharePoint. Yeah. Yeah. Can you put them? Oh, so, so yes. Okay. Uh, well, as, as we said at the beginning of the meeting, if you don't want it shown, don't, uh, you know, share, don't show it. So, so everything, everything is, so I think we have all of the slides that we, We do. So yes. people should email me if there's some reason they don't want them on the website that we sent out earlier that had all the papers. And then, in the and then we will talk because, <laughs> because that will be a problem. Yeah. So, okay. So our plan is to post them all very, very soon. Okay. Um, and I would, I would like to thank um, everybody on the planning group who did a fabulous job of working on this, the working group chairs who also did an incredible group, uh, job, and, and everybody you know, around this table really was involved in these working groups, which was great. Also, many thanks to Ian Mapuri who kept us all organized and ready to go. So thank you, Ian. All right. Okay. I think, uh, I think uh, we're done. Sorry, I'd just like to finish by thanking Terry and NHGRI for actually funding this whole enterprise as well. So it's been yes. very useful. Oh. And thanks to you all for partic participating so enthusiastically in a long day. It's, it's been great. Great. All right. Thank you. Safe travels. Bye now.